great. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's good to see so many people from around the world. Gosh, I started counting the, the, the countries, but then I had to stop after a while because there's so many different countries represented. So let's get going because I have so many ideas to share with you today. So in this webinar, I'll be talking about managing mixed abilities and utilizing assessment for learning in the primary classroom. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you is to make sure that you have uh, something to write with, like a normal pen or pencil, and uh, a piece of paper that you're going to write on. So pen and paper, and maybe even your mobile phone for you to take quick, um, a quick photo of the things that I'll be sharing with you. Okay, so first, let's do a get to know me activity. Uh, so as Kolos said, um, we're both uh, based in Hungary, we live in Hungary. Uh, so now I'll be sharing a bit more, uh, a few more details about myself. And I would like you to listen and see what are some of the things you and I have in common. And take your pen and write down the things that you in person and I may have in common. You can also guess some of the things uh, or you can anticipate what else uh, could be true about myself. Okay, ready? Ready to listen and write? Yes, great. Good. So, um, I live in a small town just outside Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary, uh, and it's a beautiful city. It's actually so beautiful that I often go there as a tourist uh, to visit and just for a walk. Um, and it, it's a beautiful city that was voted the most beautiful city in Europe uh, last year, back in 2019. Um, and I started to work here and teach here back in 96, 1996 in, uh, at International House in Budapest. And before that, I used to teach and live in Romania. Uh, so I've been teaching and training uh, for actually 26 years now. Uh, I have two teenage daughters, wonderful daughters, who are very, very clever uh, and beautiful and uh, very hard working and of course they sometimes fight as teenagers would um, but we we love to chat and go for walks together and cook together so we do a lot of things together and the third thing uh, that i would like to share about me is that i to, to in order to stay um, healthy physically and mentally too i do yoga almost every day um, and I try to um, be very strict with myself to do the, um, the different asanas um, which help me not only in terms of physical health but also to, to stay focused during the day. Right, so I'll stop talking and now can you type one thing that you in person and I have in common? If, you, if there's nothing we have in common, just say nothing. Oh, lots of you do yoga and you live in a small town. You like going for walks. You love Budapest. You have two daughters. You have children. You live in a small town. Teaching and yoga, great. You're also an English teacher, great. Yes. Well, I believe that all of us have have something in common and which is uh, teaching. Yes, great. You've got two children too, lovely. Now this is an activity you can also do with uh, the children in your class where you start talking about yourself and you get them to listen and identify the things that uh, they in person and you have in common. And then you can also put them in pairs 
and get them to do the same thing in pairs or groups. And it's a lovely way to get them to connect to each other. Right, oops. Now, let's, let me just go back one slide. So, now I have a teaching question to you. The role of a teacher is that of an observer and a guide. It is the child who ultimately teaches themselves. Is this true or false? What do you think? Is it true or false? Many of you started to write true. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also think that this is our main role, that of an observer and a guide. And it really is the child who ultimately teaches themselves because every child is different. All of us are different. We come in different colors and shapes and different thoughts, different emotions, different interests. So we are all very different uh, and we have different goals uh, in life, different goals during the lesson in terms of what we would like to achieve. So we as teachers, we can only observe and guide our students to become the best version of themselves. And I can see that my video is a bit slow, but hopefully you can hear me well. Can you just give me uh, just a, um, a quick feedback on, on whether you can hear me well or not? Can you hear me okay? Is the quality of audio okay? I can see many of you put true for the statement. Okay. Right. So now let's look at the questions that we'll be focusing on today. First, uh, we'll look at how can we re-engage our students during the online and or our classroom lessons regardless of their abilities. Also, how can we involve parents in their children's learning? And finally, we'll also look at how we can utilize assessment for learning to meet the specific needs of the primary learner. I think I'll stop my video for a moment so that um, the quality is a bit better. Okay, so let's look at the first question. How can we re-engage our students during online and or classroom lessons regardless of their abilities? So first, let's look at uh, our students in the mixed ability classroom. Let's define or let's maybe think about how they might feel and what they might think. So imagine that you have strong and very weak students in the same classroom and students open the course book. How do you think a strong student would react to that? How might they feel? What might they think? Or in the same way, how would a weak student react to the same text? 
how might they feel or what might they think. Can you type your answers in the chat box? I can see that the chat has slowed down quite a lot, probably because there's a great number of people in the room. Okay, so some weaker students would say, I don't understand. Other weaker students would say, hmm, I'm not good at this. Some strong students might also say, hmm, well, this is boring. I know this all. There's nothing new. Uh, so it's very different how students react to the same piece of material. Um, so we have to consider how students feel and how they react because their feelings then influence the way they will think about themselves. If they feel negative about their performance uh, or they think that they're not good at something, that will definitely um, um, make them think that mm, I'm not good at English, I'm going to fail my next text test as well. So they, they start to um, feel low about themselves and as a result they won't um, want to be engaged in the lesson anymore. Also, um, this will lead to um, poor awareness or even unawareness of their own strengths and weaknesses, um, which again, because they're not aware of their own strengths or weaknesses, can lead to poor performance during the lessons. So Hi everyone, can everyone on. hear me? Now Sorry, I talked had to a great number of teachers technical about problems. the impact um, so I'll of present the past Erica. few months um, um, on so audio is not working at the moment, so please do bear with us. Students. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, um, so I'm one of the moderators, and um, the, uh, different types we've of been having some technical uh, some issues in the past that there's little um, few or no minutes, so please do bear with us. Um, uh, because of the online whilst teaching, we try to get Erica back, uh, there are great um, gaps with her audio. Uh, between learners, Thank you very much. Um, and in their language, um, in the meantime, do um, grab a drink or <laughs> have a few minutes home. break whilst we get uh, many students Erica back. Have lost connections Thank you. with each other or with, with uh, their friends. They feel lonely. Um, they are even more disengaged um, than they were in the. Um, um, Hi everyone, there, there is sound in the room, it's just we haven't <laughs> said anything, that's why, don't panic, we're all there, we're all here, um, we're trying to reach Erica at the moment, so just bear with us, thank you.
Hi everyone, um, Erica, our presenter, is just going to leave the room and then come back and hopefully um, we can resume our session. Sorry about this, um, we've been having some technical problems with the room itself, um, so it's um, disrupted our webinar session and hopefully we're going to resume in the next few minutes. Thank you for your, your patience. Can you hear me now? I'll start my webcam again. Great. Oh, okay. So now it's good. Great. So we're back. Lovely. Thank you for your patience. You've been wonderful. So these are the, some of the things that teachers have told me that this is a, how they were impacted or their students have been impacted by the uh, online learning during the pandemic. Which one was true for you uh, while you were teaching? Number three, Katya, for you three. Mm -hmm. Number two. I see, yeah. Okay, so in terms of re-engaging our students um, in different ways, making sure that all students, regardless of their uh, language level are still engaged both in the online and in the face-to-face -face classroom environment there are different strategies we can use so we have to make sure that we build connections um, because of the reasons we've listed earlier they they tend to lose connections and connections are very important for us uh, um, in our learning uh, we need to make sure that we offer them enough choice uh, so that all students, regardless of their um, interests or abilities, can have something to do have something to offer. Um, maybe also involving uh, them in, by giving them different responsibilities through giving them different roles uh, during our lessons. And finally, making sure that our tasks are open-ended so that there's not just one way to answer a question, but there's multiple ways uh, of answering the same question. So here's an example activity uh, which you can use at the beginning of the year or basically any time of the year. So I'm going to do it with you partially, just the beginning, because it's, it's, it uh, works in a different way online. So I would like you again to take your pen and paper and first, draw a fruit. So draw a fruit. For example, I would draw an apple, but I would like you to draw a different fruit, any fruit. Okay. Now, draw a vegetable, any vegetable. For example, I've drawn uh, a cucumber, but you can draw either a cucumber or any other vegetable you would like. Don't type in the chat box, just draw. Just draw. Okay, don't type. Okay, good. And now write a number between 1 and 100. Again, just write on your piece of paper. <laughs> you can also write in the chat box if you want. 
Okay, great. Now, so this is what students do. And then I get them to stand up and mingle and do the following thing. So, for example, my number is 68. And this is the um, conversation that they, they have to um, act out. My name is Apple Cucumber. What's your name? So, can you type your name in the chat box? My name is Apple Cucumber. What's your name? Grape Tomato. Nice to meet you, Grape Tomato. Peach Pepper. Nice to meet you, Peach Pepper. Pineapple Carrot. Nice to meet you, Pineapple Carrot. Great. Right. I am 68. How old are you? I am 68. How old are you? <laughs> wow, we have so many different ages. Great. Now, what you can do with this activity is then once children have mingled uh, and asked um, all the other classmates about their names and ages and introduced themselves, is to try and find their family members. So who would I need to look for if I wanted to find my own family members? Who would I need to look for? Not apples, but cucumbers, exactly. So I would have to listen out for the family name, the cucumber. Okay, and those people would be part of my family. And then... Uh, once they get together as, as a family, they can also get them to decide who is who in the family, depending on their age. So who is the father, who is the mother, who is the grandmother, maybe great-grandmother, um, the child, granddaughter, etc. And they have a lot of fun doing these things, uh, and they really enjoy it. And once they, they form their families, sometimes, of course, we also end up with some children who don't have, um, they cannot find family members. So what I do is to uh, get other families to adopt them or, uh, or to uh, adopt, adopt these, um, these children who have not found other uh, family members uh, in the classroom. So these families then serve as the support family during the year. So whenever they have a question, either during the online lesson or outside the lesson, this is the, their family uh, with members they can turn to. And they really like um, this kind of um, connection uh, that they build um, amongst um, the class. Um, oh, Rabia, spinach. Well, I don't know if you've... I haven't seen any spinach, but I'm sure you'll find a family who, who will adopt you. <laughs> okay, right. So in terms of building connections, we obviously have to build in a lot of pair and group work activities. And some of the pair and group work activities are, um, are ones where, which do not require any language and others that require some language. Uh, to be used. For example, the one that we had before, like, what's your name? Uh, my name is Apple Cucumber. Uh, how old are you? I'm 68. This kind of activity does require some language um, to be used. But there's other activities that can be easily incorporated, um, which do not require language. So it's very uh, beneficial for weaker students, too. Uh, and there's two games I would like to share with you. The trust game and the mirror game. You probably know the trust game where you put students in pairs. So this can um, take place only in the face-to-face -face classroom. So you put students into pairs. Uh, one is standing in front of the other person, uh, turning their back to the other person. And the person in the front has to close their eyes. And the person from the back is going to be uh, lead them through the classroom through very slow movements, making sure that they don't hit anything uh, and looking after each other, being very, very careful. 
uh, and this is how they just move around the classroom. You can also play some nice and quiet music while they're moving around the classroom and looking after each other. And when the music stops, they also stop moving and then they take turns. So this is a, a lovely way to get them to trust each other and also to feel that they are safe because someone is looking after them and making sure that they are safe. Now, the mirror game, again, is something that you can maybe try in the online classroom uh, if you're using Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, and basically, again, you put students in pairs uh, we can try it now. Uh, obviously, I won't be able to see you, but you can still do it with me. So this is a game that doesn't require any speaking, so you're not allowed to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can smile, of course. Uh, and I'll make some slow movements, and I would like you to follow my movements. So imagine that you're looking in the mirror. Yeah. So let's start with the same movement. Okay, I'll stop. So you get the idea <laughs> that you put students into pairs, and you can do this in Zoom as well. One student uh, does the slow uh, these movements very, very slowly, and the other one has to follow. So it, it you really have to pay attention to the other person and to try and and and, and feel their vibes and and try to anticipate how they will move. So it's a very nice activity to get them to connect to each other, even though they may not have the, um, the language to do that. Okay, so let's move on to another activity, which does involve some language. Um, and in this case, I'm also going to offer some choice. Okay, now imagine that your name is not Sovita, your name is not Renata, your name is not... Um, Kolosh, uh, your name is not Mario, okay? You're all Erika, okay? You're all Erika. Your name is not Hindu. No, no, you're not Hindu. You are Erika. You are me, okay? So imagine that you're me, okay? Right. Now, I would like you to choose two of these sentence starters and Finish the sentence as if you were me. So finish it so that it's true for Erica. I like the beach. That's true. I like doing yoga. That's also true, Sylvia. I like my daughter. That's true, Gabriella. I like teaching. Great. Uh -huh. Okay. Yesterday I worked a lot. Mm, that's not true. I can sing. Ah, yes, that's true. I can swim. Well, uh, I can, but I'm afraid of swim swimming. I don't like COVID. That's true. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this is what you do with children. Again, you put them in pairs. You get them to choose two or two sentence stems, depending on what they can finish, what they understand. The, what language they understand, which of these sentences that they can tackle. And they're welcome to finish the sentence in as many words as they can. Uh, I like swimming, or I like swimming in the sea, or I like swimming in the sea uh, when it's really hot. So depending on their language level, they will add more and more words. And again, because they have choice, uh, and they're free to choose, they all feel happy and they feel that they have been able to 
uh, fulfill the task that they, they were asked to do by the teacher. Let's move on uh, and look at some ways of offering choice. So as I said earlier, through offering choice, you're, you basically ensure that all students uh, can be involved in your lesson, in the activities. Uh, because they have um, their their ability or their interest matches the task that you set through the choice that you set. Uh, so you can give learners choice through the topic uh, in terms of how they respond to a particular task, in terms of the activity they do, they can choose that. Uh, and they can also choose the number of items to work with. So for example, um, earlier, you see, um, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, I could also say there are two, four, six items here. I would like you to choose minimum two to fill in. But it's up to the students. Or for homework, fill in minimum three. But again, you choose. So you set a minimum number of items for them to complete. Uh, and it's up to them which ones they complete. And you only give them a minimum number. Uh, now here's um, a way to um, offer them choice through topic. So let's imagine that um, our topic is how can we be healthy? So my question is, what are some of the things that help you Stay healthy. Can you type your answers in the chat box? Sports, exercise, great. Walking, eating fruits and vegetables, great. Exercise, lots of sleep, good. <laughs> Happiness, yeah. We sometimes think mostly about food and sports and we don't think about our feelings. Yeah, happiness, yoga, diet. Meditation, water, well being, company that is so important, exactly. Okay, so uh, you ask the same question from students, and then you can put them in groups depending on the uh, on what they may be experts in. Maybe some students are experts in food and they know a lot about how to stay healthy. Um, and what kinds of foods to, to eat. Other students may, may know a lot more about the different sports that, um, that are, you know, help you to stay healthy. Other students may know uh, more about different outdoor activities and free time activities that help you to stay healthy. Um, so then you put them into diff these different groups that um, are formed based on interest and then of course in these groups uh, we'll have different um, students with different ab abilities and then you can get them to uh, research their own topic and create a poster about their topic um, and present it to the rest of the class uh, so one group of students um, maybe um, does some research on the different types of food that you can find, they can find in, in their environment and, and how um, they are healthy, how they stay healthy through cooking these types of foods. The other group looks at different types of sports, indoor sports, and, and again, they create a poster about it and present it to the rest of the class. So again, in this way, all students would be motivated to stay engaged because they're working uh, with a topic that they are interested in. Now, as I said earlier, you can also offer them choice in how they respond. So, for example, you, set, you give them a text and they can respond in three different ways. They can read the text and write something as a response. They can read the text and draw something as a response or read the text and do more research uh, as a response. So, for example, um, here's a story from Bright Ideas uh, Level 2. And uh, 
you set this, you can set this for homework or you can do this in class. Uh, and you give these three different types of responses. And you get students to choose which one they would like to, um, uh, to do in that lesson. Would they like to um, look at the true-false sentences and answer those true-false sentences? Would they like to read the text and then maybe underline their favorite um, sentence and, um, and maybe illustrate it or draw um, uh, an illustration for this sentence? Or uh, another group maybe can uh, research, uh, do some research after they've read the text and find or think of a similar animal story from their country. So they decide which one they would like to do. And then you put them together. So students who would like to do the true or sentences, please sit together. Students who would like to read and draw, again, sit together and students would like to do the research again sit together and they would then collaborate and work together in, in uh, uh, completing their task and once they've completed their task you can get them to share uh, their findings and this is a nice way to work with one text uh, but with different tasks where students get to choose um, the different task depending on how ready they feel to, to tackle um, that particular task. Now you can also give them different roles and responsibilities um, in the language, uh, in the classroom. Uh, and, and these roles may not um, involve any, any language knowledge, but they would still have some kind of, you know, useful responsibility. So for example, the dice master so you can you can use an online dice as well there's lots of free online dice but in the face-to-face -face classroom give them like a, a regular dice and when you come to a smaller decision to be made during the lesson for example okay shall we listen to the song again yes or no so it's a small decision to be made okay and then it's not you who makes a decision, but you get the dice master to roll the dice and through that to tell the class what decision has been made. So, for example, the dice master will say, okay, number one, two, three will mean yes, we'll listen to the song again. If, we, if I roll four, five or six, that means no, we won't listen to the song again. And, and they roll the dice and then they tell the class what the result is. And they feel proud that, you know, they've, they've been involved um, in decision making during the class. In the same way, you can also have a timekeeper um, in the face-to-face -face classroom. Maybe a, a weaker student who finds it more difficult to maybe, I don't know, uh, write or is lower writing or maybe dyslexic. You can say at one point, okay, so in this activity you are the timekeeper can you make sure that after five minutes um, everybody stops writing and tell me when the time's up and and again they feel involved and and uh, engaged in the lesson and also proud that they they have um, an important task um, as I said earlier uh, now all of these tasks ensure that there, there's not only one answer that is correct, but multiple answers are also acceptable. Uh, for example, if you play charades, in, even in that game, uh, you can act out the same word in different ways. Um, also, it's important to give them open questions. So it's not only the tasks that are open-ended, but the questions you, you set are also open-ended. So if we go back to the topic, how can we stay healthy? So around the topic of health, you can get students to brainstorm lots of different questions they would like to find the answer to. And they write their questions on, on little slips of paper, which you can all collect as a class. Everyone can read other people's questions. 
you can maybe research, get students to research, go home and, and, and find the answers to some of these questions. You can get students to categorize these questions depending on how important they are or what they're connected to, uh, etc. Um, the sentence stems activity that I showed you earlier is also um, an open-ended task because it allows students to write as many words as they want, uh, complete it in just a few words if their language ability is lower or if they're a stronger student then they can write longer sentences. Um, also, giving them mini project work, especially in the online classroom, is very, very important where they get to work using a pen and paper and colors and cutting. Um, so something very physical is important to give them the opportunity to stay away from the monitor and the laptop um, um, because they spend uh, quite a lot already in, in front of the computer. So let's look at an, an example of a mini project work. So um, if, say, the topic is um, helping at home uh, and you first get students to look at the image from the course book and discuss what the children do and how they help at home, um, in this case, they uh, take out the rubbish, uh, they water the plants, they clean the windows. Then you can set as a mini project work to draw the different ways they help at home. In this way, you also uh, talk about the values that are important around the family. Oh, happy World Teachers Day, Varsha, <laughs> to everyone. Um, so going back to, to our mini project work, uh, in this way, you're also educating children to think and consider the different ways they help at home. And they can draw all these activities, which uh, you can display around the classroom, or you, um, you can make a digital poster um, out of all these uh, drawings that a student sends you. Um, and um, they can also check what other children do at home, how they help uh, their parents, and see if they can do maybe a little more to have their parents at home. OK, so uh, I would like to share this checklist with you. Um, a number of questions we've come up with my colleague at Dudley, who we co-wrote this this uh, book together, Mixed Ability Teaching. So in order to engage and involve students of different um, language abilities, we have to consider different things when we plan in our lessons and when we teach. So are students provided with choices and options at any time in our lesson, in my lesson? So ask yourself these, these check questions. Are there any opportunities for getting students to help each other? This is another very important um, point. So are, am I helping them to connect to each other, especially during the pandemic? But even, even the, if there's no pandemic and if you teach face-to-face, -face, it's very, very important that we always connect and learn how to help each other. Number three, are there maybe any activities that are problematic or might be problematic? For some students, if yes, how can I make these tasks more open-ended so that they are achievable and doable by all the students in my class? Or what are some of the tasks that I can set um, so that I help uh, the students who might have problems with these tasks? OK, so if you use this checklist when you plan your lessons, I'm sure that you'll, you'll find ways to engage all the students in your classes. Now, moving on to our second question, how can we involve parents in their, in their children's learning? Um, and let's look at some statements, uh, mostly in connection with the online teaching environment. So during the pandemic, most of us had to go on uh, in teaching online through Zoom or other, um, other um, um, online platforms. 
Uh, and uh, a lot of parents have been put in difficult situations uh, where they were not only working from home, but I, uh, some of my colleagues told me that they were actually doing the homework for their child who could not, who could, couldn't do their homework because they couldn't understand the task. So sometimes even parents ended up trying to guess what the teacher wanted from their children. So it's, it was very, very difficult for the parents. So we have to maybe think a little bit more about how, what we can expect from them, especially in the online environment and what we shouldn't expect. So let's look at these statements. Uh, number one, true or false. Parents should have their child do their homework. True or false? Number one. Just number one. Yes, I agree. It's false. Parents should not be expected to have their child to do their homework. If children cannot do their homework, it means that we maybe we haven't given them enough support in doing their homework or we haven't given them enough support in how to find a way to find support maybe from another uh, peer from their support family as i said earlier we need to ensure that they have like somebody in the classroom who can help the, each other yeah so setting up like study buddies or a support family number two Parents should ensure a secure learning environment without distractions. Number two, true or false? True, absolutely. Now, this is what we should we should be expecting from parents. This is key uh, in in you know, especially in the online environment for, for for a child to be able to focus. We have to make sure that we tell parents, please remove all the distractions from around the, the laptop, from around um, the area where your child is. You know your child best. Please make sure that there is nothing that could distract your child. Number three, parents should teach a child the things they cannot learn autonomously. True or false? False, exactly. They sh we shouldn't expect parents to be the teachers. Uh, they have enough on their plate. We should not expect them to also uh, start teaching. They're, they, that's, it's a job. You know that it's a job. It, it, it requires uh, special skills and knowledge to, to be a good teacher. Parents are parents. All they need to do is just love their children and play with them. Oops. Okay, number four. <laughs> parents should play with their child in English if they can true yes so if if you get to uh, communicate with them just say please just play with your child do nothing else if you can play in English but if not just play with it in your own language that that's the best you can do with your child and number five parents should keep it light fun and easy true or false absolutely true yes so very often I find that parents feel that, oh my God, now I have to make sure that my my daughter or my son will will just do, you know, will have great marks and we have to study a lot. No, especially not during the pandemic when everything is so is stressful enough. So we have to ensure a safe and, and uh, fun learning environment where we revise a lot and we keep it light and fun. And uh, it would be very important for us to support parents in, in, in feeling that, yes, all you need to do is just keep it light and fun um, and just play with your child. So uh, you can tell them, uh, oops, I, okay, I forgot to flick through the slide. <laughs> so... Uh, in uh, in order to support them, you can give them this link, which um, has lots and lots of different, very simple articles, uh, which give parents ideas in terms of how they can play with their child in English, different types of vocabulary games, for example, um, lots and lots of different games that they can play just in a fun way. 
So you using it great, Sylvia. Um, also, there are some videos for parents. I'm not sure if you know about these videos, different videos on how to uh, help their child learn at home, but again, through a very playful um, and through lots and lots of games, including how to uh, help their um, child practice self-control, how to read stories, etc. Let me check if I can paste the link. This may be the right link. So if you go to this link, um, then um, it will send you to the um, OUP website with all these links for the parents. And finally, let's look at our last question. How can we utilize assessment for learning to meet the specific needs of the primary learner? So um, I would like to turn to you now and ask you some of the challenges that you have faced in terms of assessment in the past few months. So what are some of your challenges that you have uh, found some of the things that you found difficult in terms of assessment. Okay, cheating. Just assessment, yeah? We're talking only about assessment. So cheating, um, motivation. Emotions from your students, stress. Anxiety. Mm -hmm. Copy paste, mm -hmm. emotions, mm -hmm. motivation, okay. I guess, Ines, you mean that you were not able to follow improvement or lack of interest? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Low self esteem, yes. So, it is very difficult with assessment, especially in the in, in the online environment. Lack of, lack of engagement, no interest. Yes. Yeah, so basically, you are you you have been facing exactly the same challenges as most of my colleagues who said that um, a very their biggest fear is uh, that of cheating in tests, especially in the online environment. Um, also. Um, because uh, many students, uh, when they come back um, in the face-to-face -face classroom or they, they get different amounts of support at home from parents, some parents helped their child a lot. Other parents did not speak any English and they didn't know how to help their children. So the gap between them uh, was even greater. Uh, also, uh, Children experience lots of difficulties in their home learning, either because of the devices or uh, no internet connection, etc. And this led to low self-belief. And as we know from research, uh, our performance in any area of life, including that of English as a subject, but this is true for any area of life, depends on our belief. So if we believe that we will succeed in something, if we believe that we are capable, if we believe that we can do it, it means that we can imagine it, we can project it. Uh, we are very much aware of our own abilities. That has the greatest impact on our performance, either in testing or in any kind of um, environment where you have to perform. So. Self-belief is of utmost importance, I believe. So let's look at some solutions. How can, what can we do, especially in the online environment? As you said, copy-paste is a problem. Cheating is a problem. So it seems that assessment of learning, where we test students and we give them tests uh, and they can copy-paste answers, is not enough anymore. Um, it may lead to unreliable results. So we need to focus on assessment for learning uh, as an assessment tool a lot more. And we'll look at what this is, um, 
briefly uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we also need to build on, on self-assessment a lot, where students reflect on their own abilities and we make sure that they, we build enough confidence. Also help children to set personal goals and guide them to achieve these personal goals and, you know, give them enough support um, in this process. So let's look at what assessment for learning is. So when you set a task, uh, while children do the task, you just observe. As we mentioned at the beginning of this session, our role is to observe and guide. So we observe children in how they perform uh, during this task. This could be a game such as charades or um, scavenger hunt or any other game that children play during a lesson, either online or face to face. Um, after this task, get the students to do self-assessment, where you just ask them a couple of questions to guide them to think about their own performance. And we'll see in a minute what kind of questions to ask. Once they thought about their own performance, good, bad, and what can I do to improve, then we, you guide them uh, towards the different strategies they can use to, um, to learn or to improve and then get them to repeat the same task, maybe with a different partner, to still make it um, fun and interesting and enjoyable with a different person. So let's look at this example. This is a speaking task in which children are asked to use questions with can, um, and they have to guess what kind, who the person is thinking about. So, for example, okay, um, can you play the violin? No, I can't. Can you play tennis? Yes, I can. Oh, I know, you're Carla. So, this is an example. So, you observe children performing this task, but of course, not everybody is going to be as fluent as I was just uh, demonstrating uh, now. So then you get students to answer these questions. When During this task, what were you good at? The words, maybe taking turns, the way you asked the questions, you remembered the words quickly. How do you know? How did you get good at it? Also, what were you not so good at? How do you know? They, maybe they didn't understand what you said, and that's why you know that your pronunciation wasn't good, or you didn't remember the word and you had to say it in your first language. And then finally ask them, how can you get good at it? Now, of course, uh, students may not be able to answer these questions in their own language. Uh, sorry, in English, of course. Uh, so ask them in their own language. And give them, say, about five, ten minutes to to think about these and 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 reflect on their own performance and and try to find their own answers. It's very important that they find their own answers, and it's not you who gives them, but you just guide them to reflect uh, on their own performance. And gradually, they will be able to find uh, um, very good strategies strategies of their own. So once they've answered all these questions in their first language, in their mother tongue, get them to repeat the same task again with a different partner. So um, now I'm going to just list a few activities that you can use to, um, um, to play in the classroom, either online or face to face. Um, as I said earlier, charades is a good one where you can get them to mime not just words but sentences as well. Um, you can play scavenger hunt again. It's a good one for either reading um, or lots of vocabulary, also speaking. Um, you can, for, as a simple, a more simple task, you know, you start drawing something and students have to guess what you're drawing, and depending on the vocabulary or the words they're shouting in, uh, you can find out um, how much they know, or what they have difficulties with. You can play memory games. So lots and lots of different types of games where you just observe their 
performance, you get them to assess themselves, think about strategies to improve, practice again, and then get them to repeat the same task in different pairs. And in that way, you can immediately see if they improve or not. And it's also fun and light, and it's not, nothing to worry about. It's, it's stress-free. Uh, children just regard it as, as a classroom activity. Um, and the same can be done through flashcards and lots of other games that you use uh, with flashcards. And some final thoughts. Keep it simple and always make sure that you find something you enjoy <laughs> and children enjoy in these lessons. And please don't rush, especially in the online environment. It's very important to keep it light and easy. Also, just observe them, as we said earlier. Observe your children, observe how they improve, observe how they react, observe their emotions, and respond to that and guide them through, um, through this jungle uh, of learning, especially in these difficult times. Uh, finally, if you would like to find out more about effective feedback, and assessment for learning, uh, please take a look at, you can download this um, position paper and it has lots and lots of great ideas and activities in terms of assessment for learning and great tips uh, for you to, to use um, in your classroom from tomorrow. And now let's turn to the questions. Do, do I have more time? How long do I have? Okay, so my colleagues tell me that I have more time. So let me look at the, uh, uh, let me, give me a moment to look at the questions uh, that uh, my colleagues have saved in a separate chat box. Um, okay, that, this is a good question. If, would you please elaborate more about correction in primary classroom, correcting grammar and spelling errors? This is a very good question. Uh, now, up until the age of 10, 11, according to psychologists, the most important things that children need to learn is how to count, how to write, how to read, and confidence. Being confident. So it is very, this is one of the most important things children have to learn, how to be confident. As I said earlier, to, to, um, if they don't learn how to be confident up until the age of 10, they will have difficulties later on in life, not only in English, but in any other areas of life. Um, believing in, in your own abilities and capabilities is key. And this kind of feeling and self-belief is formed around this age um, and it's the basis of this feeling that yes I can do it yes I believe in myself is shaped until the age of 10 which means that we have to be extremely careful in terms of what we correct and when we correct and especially how we correct so I would say that apart from lots of noticing getting children to notice their errors um, and and maybe even peer correction, I would uh, probably avoid um, sort of I correct your grammar mistakes or I correct your writing or I correct your spelling mistakes as a teacher. I would definitely just maybe even if they make a spelling mistake, I would say, hmm, look at this word again. I'll write it for you. And you write it down. And get them to underline the differences between their version and your version. Or the version in the book and their version. Get them to notice and assess their own language and how they spell that particular word. Or assess their own grammar, how they, they um, form that sentence. And get it, maybe if they cannot find the difference or can't find the answer, maybe get their colleague or get their peer to help them. Okay, so I would be very, very careful to 
focus more on on noticing uh, developing noticing skills for themselves rather than uh, correction um, we have another question on extended re reading I believe there are some um, webinars uh, if you go to the OUP website uh, there are some uh, in the archives webinar archives you will find webinars on uh, on how to develop um, reading skills for extend uh, extensive reading um, now let's see What is my favorite game of all? Well, I don't have a favorite game. Um, all of these games are great. Well, it depends on what you would like to use it for. Um, where can you find the book on mixability? Well, if you go to the, uh, you can order it from Amazon, I believe, uh, or um, if you just Google it, I'm sure you will find different bookshops where you can buy it. Um, Okay, how do you slow down higher level students who are domineering? Well, that's this is a very good question, but it would uh, require me to give you like different types of activities. But if you go to, uh, if you um, check the mixed ability book, you'll find lots of different tips on how to um, manage domineering students, what types of tasks to give them to keep them busy and engaged. Uh, but still dominate less. I'll just give you just maybe one tip. If you, for example, during the charades game, I would get the domineering student to do the miming, not the guessing, because then they would have to just stay quiet. <laughs> so always find ways in which you, you can uh, control their, um, their level of, of, um, of involvement. Charades is, is the game, uh, Latifa asked me what charades is, is a game where students mime different sentences or different words and another group of students guess, tries to guess and whoever guesses first the correct word or the correct sentence is the winner. Uh, Kate says that self-assessment may lead to frustration because students may not understand self-assessment questions and the concept itself. How do I avoid this? Well, I, I believe that if you focus on self-assessment questions and the ones that I showed you earlier, gradually, without a great deal of expectation, first of all, just a bit by bit, and you get students to get used to asking themselves these questions they will eventually get used to uh, assessing themselves and thinking about their own performance, in my experience. So I think we have to maybe think more about our own expectations as teachers, what we expect of students. Maybe we expect too much at the beginning, maybe uh, when we ask them to assess themselves. Maybe we need to expect less or just stay open and be curious as to how much they can assess them, the, themselves initially and just be patient and give them time to practice this skill as well. Uh, now, I'm 10 minutes over. Do I have more time to answer these questions? Kolosh, Simon, what do you think? We can take one last question. Okay, so Mishko Panov asked the question, how do you help students with low vocabulary knowledge and phonetics learning difficulties improve? Mm, I'm not quite sure I understand. So um, you're asking if, if you have students with uh, uh, learning difficulties, how do I help them uh, with English? Well, mm, if you're thinking about students who are dyslexic um, or um, may be slower at reading and spelling, I use a lot of listening. So I tell a lot of stories uh, or I even record the stories and I send the student the stories and a lot of pictures, a lot of images. 
So for, for those students, I get them to uh, complete the tasks through drawing. Or they choose whichever uh, way they want to respond to a particular thing. But if, for example, if they find if they're severely dyslexic um, or they're very, very slowly uh, readers or they have extreme difficulties with reading, then I get them to listen to the same story and draw as a response or do something as a response, maybe act out something in, in, instead of writing. Or doing some some more serious uh, research or um, a task which involves more complex skills. Okay, so I think um, I managed to answer all the questions that I had saved by my colleagues who've been great at um, uh, looking up to you and making sure that I have all the questions. Thank you so much for being so engaged and so active. You've been wonderful. And hope to see you somewhere around the world, either in person or uh, through another webinar soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Erika. Thank you for the lovely presentation. I can. I hope you've been able to uh, follow the chat and you had very, very warm uh, wishes. Uh, should I say applause? Uh, thank you. Um, now, let me just get back to um, the uh, link which shows you, uh, which takes you to the survey, actually. So um, here is um, what, uh, where you could go to. Uh, find the survey and also don't forget um, there will be another uh, sort of extra uh, sent in an invitation in, a, in an email uh, following this webinar where we would like you to participate um, right I've just put this in the chat box because we don't have a slide for that but uh, I hope um, you, you, you will find it. I'm sure you will get the email uh, with, the, um, with the links to the um, webinar recordings later on. And one last thing. Um, happy World Teachers Day, everyone. It's so lovely to have this opportunity. And thank you for uh, joining us today. It was a very, very nice crowd. And enjoy the rest of the day.